Good afternoon, Anna Hope. Good afternoon. The White Rock, Le Rocher Blanc, published in French by Le Bruit du Monde, opens with a bus filled with people cruising through the Mexican desert towards the Pacific Ocean with a Mara Akame, a shaman in the language of the Wixaricas, and a narrator, a writer who echoes the thought of the reader as to what are they all doing here? <laughs> Is each chapter, each date part of the current that explains what brings these people in the 2020s to the White Rock? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and I think, you know, the answer is yes, because it's a very personal narrative. You know, the, the character of the, of the writer is drawn very much from my own life, but the questions that she is carrying as to what the hell are they all doing there um, you know, it can be answered in a very personal way. Obviously, I can give the facts of my story, uh, which explain why the writer's in the bus, but it's also, as you say, um, a question about the larger tides of history that have brought uh, these mostly Western um, travellers to this place to have this encounter with um, a, a shamanic culture um, and this extraordinary place of potency which is the white rock itself i felt that time was central while reading the book but not time as we mostly approach it in the novel i felt you underlined the paradox in that we are not eternal but act as if we were while nature is closer to eternity but our acts and under that how do you reconcile time with death and life in the context of the white rock the existence of a human being and the existence of a place. Wow, that's, that's very beautifully put. Um, I mean, I think I was, um, you know, at the time of writing the novel and certainly in the year before I began writing the novel, I became incredibly involved in environmental activism. and. You know, that was a lot of fear and a lot of energy and a lot of um, thinking about time. So the idea that we have 12 years to um, make the changes that are necessary or we are headed for cataclysmic climate breakdown or, you know, my daughter is three now, you know, by the time she's 15, what world are we going to be in? So I was living, I felt, in a very... Um, accelerate not accelerated but very sort of an, a sort of intensification actually of of, of, this, of the sense and the meaning and the importance of time with relation to the natural world and the you know the effect the, how we may exert our will you know in terms of activism to try and save but the journey that I went on in the writing of the novel was one of I mean in no way did I become uh, released from the idea that humans need to um, engage in um, manifold actions to um, restore uh, our relationship with the natural world. But I think through the writing of the novel, I came to a very different sense of the place of the human in relation to the natural world. Um, and in fact, the final scene of the novel, I think, encapsulated some of my f feelings um, there's the South that was standing on the beach in Mexico and there's the South that was writing the South standing on the beach in Mexico who had had this journey of writing the novel and oh, time, I mean it's interesting, I'm going to go on stage and talk about time in like half an hour and you're making me think about time in the novel and it's the time that it takes place and the time of the writing and the thinking about time and the thinking about the human in time and the and then this, at the centre of it all is this rock, which has seen everything um, and which will be there when we are gone, you know, and, and yeah, and I know that's not a very clear answer to your question, but your question has just kind of made me think about all sorts of different things. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, reading The White Rock, I felt that the main characters were the rock itself, of course, but also that the human part lied more within the rituals, the beliefs, what was transmitted rather than in the characters themselves. On the individual, 
as if we were all part of a tie, a link to which we are mostly blind. How did you approach writing with nature and transmission of tradition? Mm, I mean, so the, the, I, I really struggled with writing The Voice of the Rock. At the beginning, I, I really wanted it to be woven throughout. Mm -hmm. And I had it at the beginning, I had it at the middle, I had it at the end. And then I was thinking, oh, there was this really beautiful book by Rebecca Solnit where she had the main text and then she had like this, this tiny text going along the bottom, this sort of Sue text. And I was thinking maybe The Voice of the Rock can somehow be there on every page. And I mean, I, I, you know, I tried many different iterations and in the end, my English editor said, I think it should be very short and I think it should be the centre of the book. And then we arrived at this, at this um, central, it's just three paragraphs, it's not much at all. Um, but I was really glad because it felt like it had some of the, the potency of my experience of the rock without, you know, projecting my human consciousness, consciousness into it too much, which is of course inevitable anyway. But, um, and then I tried to avoid writing too much about ritual, actually, mm -hmm. because I felt like it wasn't my place. Mm -hmm. Also because it's so deeply sacred and uh, to the Waradika that, you know, that their, their rituals were not, were not for me to really to try to translate. I could only, I felt, talk a tiny bit about my, ex my experience of them. Acknowledge them. Acknowledge them, exactly. Acknowledge them and acknowledge that it was my thirst for that connection, really, and my hunger for that connection. Um, yeah, so, and again, time, you know, I could say there's a very linear, you know, part where I was trying to have a child and that led me to this connection and stuff. And then there's another, there's another part which says, well, yeah, that there's something else going on. <laughs> You talk about the decolonizing process, both in the story and in a note, regarding the elements of language chosen. The writer questions her right to these prayers as a British woman within a culture that was violently oppressed. You mention at the end of the book conversations that guided you in your writing. Can you please explain how you approached both in the subject and in your writing this issue? Yeah, so it relates back to what I was saying about the sort of the time of the that I'm writing about and the time of the writing. And I would say that that process that I went on during the time of the writing, I started off extremely sort of sure that we had 12 years to save the planet and or there would be civilizational collapse, you know? And I think in, in the process of writing, particularly about the, the UMA people, you know, this, this sense that, that like, well, who's civilization, <laughs> you know? and a, a much deeper understanding that, that our civilization is built upon the collapse of many civilizations or the you know a, attempted ethnocides of many civilizations of human and not non-human you know and as I was understanding that much more deeply I, I, I always always knew that to write in the voice of an indigenous girl was going to be potentially deeply problematic um, and I always knew that I needed a mentor, but it was very difficult for me to find one. And eventually I, I saw this guy posting on Twitter, David Shorter, and he's a professor at UCLA um, in California. And he had written a book about the Yaki Yoeme. I mean, they call themselves Yoeme, and they call themselves Yaki to, to the world. But their world, word for themselves is Yoeme. Um, but, um, as, but David uh, had done 20 years field work with the UMA and he, I wrote to him on Twitter and I just said, I, I'm searching for a mentor to help me. Would you be prepared to read my text? And he said, yes. And um, yeah, he read sections of the book and was unbelievably helpful and funny. And, uh, and in the end, when he thought it was good enough, he passed it to his mentor who is a UMA poet and educator and he's called Felipe Molina and I actually had Felipe's book I'd read it um, it's called Yaki Deer Songs and it was published in 1984 uh, and I had it and I was like what it's Felipe Molina and Felipe read the text and he said um, he, he helped me with all sorts of uh, language choices um, 
But the biggest moment was that I had um, the sister uh, attempt suicide uh, in the center of the book, the elder sister. Mm -hmm. And both men said, please change that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because, you know, many things are true about, 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 about the Yaki, but, but above all, you know, we are a people who have uh, survived, <laughs> you know, and we have resisted and we have survived and we are still here and we still have our culture, you know, our, a phenomenally rich culture and we have our culture in Sonora and we have our culture in Arizona and suicide is not really what this girl should be doing. And, and I, yeah, it was, I, I changed it obviously, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but it was, yeah, there are many examples in terms of kind of the relationship with the natural world, with the grandmother. They really helped me work with the grand character of the grandmother and uh, her relationship with the herbs. And yeah, it was it was wonderful. I was yeah, it was it was so good to have them. Uh, yeah. At the beginning of the novel, you write and you stated that earlier in the conversation how to tell the reasons of the presence of the narrator in the bus is complicated. Um, I quote you from the book, or you could simply admit that this is complicated, that there are many different sides to every story and leave it at that. Is a story like a rock? And by telling a part of the story, you must accept to leave some other part in the shadows, both as a writer and as a reader. Yeah, I mean, yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I brought a lot out of the shadow, I think, yeah. <laughs> in this book, you know, I mean, I had friends who uh, read it and they were like, wow, okay, you really, <laughs> you really wrote about von Stuffer and, and I think originally I was not going to be writing auto fiction for the contemporary section, I, I had a whole other fictional uh, character, it was all going to be fiction, and then And then I realized that the story that I was experiencing, the story that I was carrying was far more potent than anything that I could invent. Um, and so I began to write autofiction, but that was, I wrote that at the very end of the writing process. So I'd written the kind of other three sections first. And I was thinking, is this just going to be totally claustrophobic? Because it's not only autofictional, then it becomes kind of metafictional because all these characters are happening inside the head of the writer and like is that just too pretentious and blah. um but in the end it just felt like the only way the only way to do it actually um yeah you are the co-founder of letters to earth can you tell us a bit about how this initiative was born and why writing to you has a strength so unique that this is an instrument for the future Uh, so, I, yeah, so I became very involved uh, with the environmental group Extinction Rebellion in the UK. Um, and I met some women um, through that and we set up this campaign Letters to the Earth. And it's still ongoing, mm -hmm. you know, people can write their letters and... Um, but this was a very intense period where we... Uh, sent a big call out to people to write letters and I think we had maybe a thousand letters that came in so particularly I would say from adolescence and so we spent a long time reading through those letters which were incredibly moving and then we published it as a book in the UK and in, in the US and that was you know the process of editing and choosing those letters and and you know rereading particularly I think the adolescent letters were just It was very intense and it was very moving and um, and yeah I mean I you know the, the book I remain incredibly proud of the book um, I think for many people the process of writing a letter itself was powerful um, uh, I took part in many workshops where we sat with people and we heard their anxieties and their 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 grief and um, yeah it was it, it was potent I mean I think the, what was the que the question was the how Why writing was writing yeah uh, an instrument for the future 
an instrument for the future. Yeah, I mean, I think it is. I, I, I it's strange because it feels like things have shifted so much in five years in terms of our awareness of the crisis and the kind of scale of the crisis, I think. And at the same time, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I, 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 I think for me, <laughs> I think for me, I realised that my personal activism had had to be to drop back, actually, and to write myself, mm-hmm. because I became I I burnt out in, with kind of you know answering the emails and mm-hmm. helping to run a campaign, and that's, that's I can't I can't be that sort of. I, I can't do that really. It's not what I can do so well. But what I felt that I maybe could do was to to write this book and to and the book that I'm writing now is very very. The, you know the natural world is completely woven into it, and I, and I feel like I can't right now without that kind of consciousness of the natural world. I can't imagine a book that is just about hu- human. Con- do you know what I mean? Like. Mm-hmm. I, like, I feel like the time for that is done, <laughs> you know, certainly for me. So I'm interested in writing that forges that space between the human and the non-human, I suppose, um, in fiction and, and on non-fiction. And, and, um, and I feel like that's... And that can only arise when you are um, att- attentive and you have the space to be attentive and to be touched and changed by... The natural world and when I suppose when I was in that state of incredibly high anxiety and it's very difficult to be touched and so to allow oneself to take time to allow oneself to, to observe and you know to be in relationship with the natural world feels to me in itself as an act of resistance and if writing arises from that then that that's the sort of writing for the future that I'm most interested in. Um, but the attention and the presence ha- has to come t- as part of that. What book, what author would you invite us to read today, discover, oh. learn about? Wow. Well, it's interesting because when I'm thinking about that scene on the beach, I'm thinking about a writer um, called Bio. Akamolafe, who is published in, he writes in English. I don't know if he's published in in France in French, um, but he writes essays and he has a wonderful website. And uh, yeah, he um, one of the essays that I wrote uh, that I read, sorry, um, that really affected me was, I think it was called the death of the climate activist, <laughs> which I found really sort of confronting as a title and. In the essay, he writes about about that very thing of questioning who has agency, like who is saving what world, <laughs> you know, who has agency in this scene, like you know, who's to say that the water itself doesn't have it? Do you know what I mean? Agency and the the kind of human hubris that that thinks that we are in charge. Um, so uh, the sort of destabilizing of hierarchies of of agency and and consciousness I found really fertile. Thank you very much, Anna Hope. (laughs) My pleasure.